And uh, okay, let's uh, let's start. Let's start. I have the full control. So thank you very much to to all of you here with us today. Uh, as say that this is one of the many webinars we are arranging. Uh, um, and uh, from 2021, we have a lot of new title and not a lot of new subjects. So please uh, um, check out uh, and find out uh, which one uh, it is of interest for you. We are ranging from many subjects. Of course, uh, we are relating uh, our subject to functional safety, today uh, security. Uh, we are talking about uh, intrinsic safety. And uh, so we have many subjects that uh, could be of interest for you. So uh, let me try if I'm able to move the page so we can start. As usual, we are running a very short introduction of uh, the company of uh, GMI, uh, starting with the, the speakers. Uh, here you have uh, myself. Uh, I'm let me say uh, 30 years uh, in the business of automation and, uh, and safety. And we have uh, also Tino with us. Tino will be the main driver. Tino is our functional safety uh, expert. Uh, I'm, I'm working with him since, uh, since 20 years. Uh, and since 20 years, we are talking together about functional safety and uh, the channel. Let me say that uh, 61511 give us also the chance now to introduce another interesting subject, which is uh, security, which is not only cyber security, but security in general, but I don't uh, uh, spoil any information I leave Tino to, uh, to introduce and to detail the subject we are talking about. So the company, I will be quite short because I said a lot of you have uh, already participated to our seminar, so you know GMI, and I'm sure a lot of you will participate to future um, seminars. So you will see again, further introduction of the company, but just few words to say GMI, who is, uh, we are an Italian company dealing with uh, um, mainly safety aspect. So whether it is intrinsic safety, whether it is a functional safety, and uh, today, and from today on also security, uh, it's a subject which deal with, uh, with, with us. So we are producing uh, engineering uh, field interface, uh, which you find uh, in many applications like DCS, ESD, uh, in pharmaceutical, petrochemical, oil and gas, and many other sector where safety is, uh, uh, is important. Uh, we as I said we are Italian, but we have uh, uh, also a presence worldwide uh, in all continents. Uh, you will receive this presentation, so I'm not going too much in detail. Uh, since we deal with uh, with uh, with safety, it is for us important quality, and that's that's why uh, we use that state of the art technology to produce our our apparatus. Um, uh, and for example, before to, to, to leave uh, uh, the company, any, any equipment is 100% tested. Um, that's, that's why we normally release a, a quite high uh, guarantee period, uh, much higher than uh, the standard delivered by the market. So this is just uh, uh, um, a short, uh, list or short view of uh, our product. So we range from intrinsic safe barrier, we range uh, until, uh, up to safety relays, uh, we have isolator, power uh, distribution, power supply systems, uh, we have multiplexer as well as hard multiplexer. Uh, we produce, uh, we design also uh, dedicated customized termination board uh, uh, and whenever we have to interface uh, uh, our equipment to the main uh, DCS and ESD system. Uh, we have a search protection system. And let me say that all these products either are, has to do with uh, intrinsic safe, uh, with ATEX, uh, with, uh, with the Zardus location or uh, they have to do uh, with the uh, functional safety seal or both. So then finally we have uh, 
just to mention uh, uh, important department in our company, uh, like in the last bullet you see, we have functional safety, uh, which uh, Tino is uh, our director of functional safety department. And we provide, and we have also um, EX department specialized in intrinsic safety issues and application. And through this department, we deliver to the market knowledge like this kind of webinar, for example, but we deliver to the market the training, we deliver to the market the consultancies. So in future, if you have any issue, uh, you may try to discuss with us. Uh, again, uh, I'm trying to change page now, but uh, I have some difficulties. Okay, yes. So I said, uh, we, we are Italian, but we are present in many, with many offices uh, around the world uh, with, uh, with distributors. Uh, and uh, just we are talking about functional safety. I would like to mention that uh, we normal deliver uh, something like uh, 20 uh, training, functional safety training courses uh, per year worldwide uh, through our Kino. Uh, we are talking, I'm talking about the functional safety training, which will then uh, provide uh, uh, even uh, the TUV certificates uh, and qualify uh, the engineer as functional safety engineer. But maybe Tino will uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, we are launching uh, right now uh, our training program for 2021. And of course, we are adapting ourselves to uh, the actual situation. And, uh, and in fact, uh, differently from the other years, uh, from 2021, we will run functional safety training online. So this is a great opportunity uh, that you may uh, find of interest and follow up also our uh, website because you can see then uh, the uh, schedule. And I'm sure you will find uh, uh, one of the training uh, uh, and one of the dates uh, suitable for your needs. Uh, okay, I say that you will receive this presentation, so I'm not, I'm not going to, to enter to detail or list uh, the, the several customer we have. This is just one, one page uh, collecting uh, some, some of the few customer we have uh, divided by type of customer from system vendors, uh, ETC, OEM and end users. And finally, let me give the speech to the heart of the webinar uh, and uh, let's go, uh, Tino, please take, take over the, the control of the slides uh, and, uh, and let's go ahead. Just a few service information uh, before to start, uh, Tino, sorry. Uh, you will receive a copy of this presentation. Uh, you will have the chance uh, to review uh, this presentation uh, following uh, our YouTube channel. Um, and what else uh, I wanted to say? Yes, for those who are interested, you will also receive a certificate of participation uh, to this webinar if you, uh, if, you, if you stay with us until the end. Uh, that's all from my side, Tino. I leave right. you the If I miss something, please. Uh, Yes, you missed a small thing, but I will give that to the participants. Okay. There is no chat box, there is a Q&A. That means uh, if you have a question, you can enter it into the Q&A box. Maru will supervise the Q&A as I'm talking. Uh, we will either try to answer them online, or we have collected some questions during the registration, and I did prepare some answers already to some of the, let's say, more interesting questions which I recognized during the registration. All right, Mara, I see your cursor is still moving, but it doesn't matter. I will uh, hopefully have control. I do have. That's it. All right. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, GMI, for giving another opportunity to the industry that we can bring some awareness to the engineers. Some of them are still working from home. Like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm virtually based now in Belgium today. Uh, all the trainings we do are all online, including now the exams, which is something new, which I will talk about it at the end. Let's first talk about the uh, topic for today. And to enter the topic for today itself, I was actually forced 
to the safety engineers by 2016 edition two of the 61511. And I did see some registration coming out of the UK. So you know this as the British standard IEC 61511. Well, there is a chapter in there called the process hazard risk analysis, which is chapter eight. And if you would quote A2.4, they say you shall carry out a security risk assessment. In other words, when the standard was released, we were all forced in our safety, let's say cocoon or culture, that now all of a sudden we also have to think about security risk assessment on the same system, the same platform, enabled to reduce a certain risk. Now, the life cycle which I show you here, for those who want to know more about this life cycle, as Mauro was saying, everything is recorded on the YouTube channel from uh, GMI. So you can go on the IEC 61511 life cycle webinar topic on the YouTube channel from uh, GMI. And there I went a little bit more in depth, which I cannot do today. But as you can see over here, the life cycle is a systematic approach from start, which is here box number one. We call this phase number one. And it's about this phase number one that we will let's say, go more in depth on the security issue. So I will not talk here about the classical functional safety story on the life cycle. We will focus more now on the security risk assessment, which is a normative requirement since addition to since 2016. And if you take phase number one, as I already mentioned in that paragraph 8.2.4, this statement here in this blue color, or in this bluish color, security risk assessment shall be carried out to identify the security vulnerabilities of your SID. In other words, you shall try to identify what are the security weaknesses of your SIS platform that could lead into a unwanted event, potentially having a consequence, which I will talk about the consequences in a minute. And the standard is classically saying in a normative requirement, you shall do it, but they don't say how to do it. And that is the whole struggle we are facing since 2016. So it's for the last four to five years now, people are trying with all kind of different information, different books, different webinars, different expert judgments. They are trying to achieve a security risk assessment. And my intention of this webinar was, or still is, that I will try to give you a little bit of guidance, although I will certainly not state that I'm the expert in security, because I'm coming out of the safety world, I'm not coming out of the security world, but now we have to work hand in hand together with those security specialists. And the standard, the SIG 1511, is giving a reference to three documents. One is called the ISA. TR stands for Technical Report 8409, which is a 2017 release. For those of you who are an ISA member, you can actually view the standard online or you can purchase it. It's a copyright uh, product. That is also why I cannot give you here any more, let's say, details as pictures out of the standard, although I do have the standard, but I will give you a few summaries out of this standard. Sorry, standard, not as a technical report. Second, we have then the IT security management systems, which are actually the 27,000 series. And by memory, I think there are about 46 parts in the 27,000 series. And one of them, the standard 6511 is referring to, is called the IEC 27001, which is also the one where a company can be accredited or can be audited against. And the last one is one of the most used standards today, although it is not so mature. In other words, it's not completely 100% released. This is coming from the old ISA 99, and it's now called the IEC 62443. And you can see here the starting date. It started all way back in 2009, and I listed here 2020, because by memory, there is one part three, section two, I think, is out since June or July, 2020. So it is still fairly new. And that is a standard, I would call this the OT security standard. I call the middle one here the IT security standard. And the, the 61511 together with the uh, 62443 standard combined 
is the guidance which you can find in the technical report 8409. That's also the slides which I have prepared. But before we start, I picked some brain of one of my uh, co-workers or, or, or colleague that I'm working with is called Stephen Smith here. He is a, an, an American fellow here based in Belgium. He is a cybersecurity and risk management specialist that I'm uh, working with. And we had some webinars or some seminars in the past together. And I like, you know, the uh, uh, pragmatic approach that Steve has taught me through all these years. And he said, rule number one, any device with software inside can actually be tricked in doing things it was not expected to do. And you may say, what does this have to do with a safety instrumented system? Well, I give you an example. For instance, you may have heard about in 2010, we had to deal with a Stuxnet virus. And a Stuxnet virus was actually not the intention of the safety PLC from Siemens that was controlling a nuclear installation in Iran to damage the plant. The system was actually meant to be used to protect the plant from any, let's say, unwanted events leading into a consequence that could damage the plant or put lives at risk, etc. But the Stuxnet virus was actually brought in with some government support. I'm not go into details, but I'm sure if you Google Stuxnet virus, you will find many different hints. But the Stuxnet virus itself, the intention was to damage the nuclear enrichment plant in Iran in 2010. And that's one example that systems with software can be totally reprogrammed to do things which were never the intention in the first place. And that's rule number one. Rule number two, any device which is connected to a network of any sort, that means a network of any sort, it can be wireless, it can be any safety buses, it can be any internet buses, in any way can be compromised by an external party. And you will say, oh, well, we have maybe firewalls or we have countermeasurements. Well, the rule is very simple. And this is coming out of the, um, this called the World Economic Forum report. And I refer here to a very old report, which was 2012. I downloaded yesterday the 2021 report. It's even more scary. So the more you start to read all those risk re reports, the more you start to understand that still we don't understand much about cybersecurity. So an example of rule number two out of the industry, because I'm coming out of the practical industry, out of the oil and gas. And you may have heard in 2012, we had to deal with a Shamoon, a malware, which was actually a Shamoon, call it a malware intention was to wipe out all the hard disks of 35,000 computers connected through one network, which were from a company which you may have heard of called Saudi Aramco. And in 2012, 35,000 computers were destroyed on the hard disk, were unrepairable, unless they replaced the 35,000 hard disk on all the computers. It was a massive impact for the company because they wiped out also not only the computers, which were the management system computers, they also wiped out all the backup, which were also, of course, based on hard disk and not in clouds at that time. So that is here the rule number two. And to continue with rule number three, which is one of the famous saying of, uh, of Stephen Smith. And the first time he, he told me that, I was like puzzling. He said, users going to pick dancing pigs over security every time. And the source is coming from Bruce Nair. And Bruce Nair is a well-known name. He's an American uh, cryptographer. And he's actually um, writing the following things that safety is a culture, but security is also a culture in the human brain. And if you would put a target on a screen saying, do not click here, how many people, if you would test them, would not click on the one they are not supposed to click? That is one simple saying that People are always taking the easy route out if it comes to security. So with that mindset, let us start on the details for the webinar. And I want to distinguish here between the risk, because there are many risks. 
I mean, we have the risk of COVID-19 and I even cannot hear the word anymore because I'm getting so sick of hearing all the media with all these topics. But risk we talk about here today, if you talk about safety definition risk, it's always we look on, on the type of consequences towards the injury of humans, towards the injury of your capital investment or your economical loss, or also to the environment damage. That is a safety definition for risk. Now the security definition for risk is an expression of the likelihood that a defined threat will exploit a specific vulnerability of a target into your industrial automation control system and or into your SIS. In combination of targets using a consequence, and that consequence can be the same again as the consequences in your safety definition. So it can be again consequences towards environment, people, or to your capital investment. A threat can be, especially as we have seen in the industry, it can be um, government sponsored. This is not a one man person during a, a nighttime doing a hobby and trying to hack a multi billion uh, national company. It's typically some government support, or there is more than one person involved in able to try to put a certain threat to a certain, let's say, company or installation. It can be any indi indication, any circumstance. It can be terrorist, can be political, whatever. And the, vul the, the vulnerability is actually any weakness that can be exploited to gain some access to a installation, unwanted, of course, but that is actually the weaknesses in our systems we will have to look at. Another topic I want to distinguish because Mauro was in the introduction already mentioning something about cybersecurity is not only IT security. Of course, it's not IT security only. It is more the OT security. As I mentioned before, the 62443, which is also the main part here of this uh, webinar. Well, the 62443 is mainly focusing on the operational technologies. And if you distinguish between IT on the left-hand side and OT on the right-hand side, OT, what is the top objective for an OT security? It is availability of production, turnover, and money. Whereas IT, the top objective is always the confidentiality. The confidentiality is actually where they try to make everything confidential that people will not have access to the unwanted media or data on their, let's say, system, uh, networks, etc., etc. So those are the two items conflicting with each other where the OT is more interested or more focusing on the availability and less on the confidentiality. Whereas the opposite, the IT is more focusing on the confidentiality and not on the availability. And that is here, the integrity is in both items the same. In between, we have here the internet of things. I'm not giving you here anything out, out of my brain. On every uh, slide you see here on the bottom, a source uh, code or a source file where you can find some more information. So if you would go to this website, as Mauro was saying, you will have the uh, copies of the slides electronically. And then you can actually uh, go more than that. Going back to the introduction of the 6.15.11 references. So the reference is three documents. The first document is Report 9, 2017, which is actually a, uh, it is aimed for the cybersecurity uh, SIS lifecycle. So for those of you like me who are coming out of the IEC 6.15.11 background, and you are aware and you are familiar to a lifecycle, I think that is the document that you should start with because that document here, report number nine, has a similar approach. They will also talk about the uh, cybersecurity process hazard analysis. And I took one of the recent white, white papers of a company out of the industry with references to it, of course, um, here in my slides, which I will give you an example later on. And the functional safety standard for the process industry 6511 is actually referring to the 62443 for the part of OT, but you will see that in report number nine, they are combining the 61511 and the 62443 into your general approach on how you can actually build a, let's say, concept 
to do a risk management for security on your system. A small word about the IT security. I call this the IT security is maybe a personal impression and I'm certainly not an IT uh, cybersecurity specialist because that is not my uh, cup of tea. That means that that is not my, uh, let's say, ex expertise over the last 25 or maybe 30 years that I'm in the industry working. The security management system family is called the 27,000. And as I said in the introduction, there are 46 different standards in there. And one that the 6511 is referring to is here the one listed here in the first line in the requirements, which is a 27,001, which is coming from 2013. And I think there was an amendment in 2015 and one in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. But that is the information for security management system requirements. So there are um, three items that the um, information security management system approaches. One is people, one is the processes, and one is the technology. And that's also a item that is more focusing on IT and not so much on OT. I'm not saying you should ignore this. Of course, you have to know the key concepts out of this. But I would like to say that most of the, let's say, main topics out of this are already incorporated in other documents, which we will refer to later on here in this webinar. Leading me to, leading me to the, yes. Excuse me, sorry to interrupt you. We have a question and I would like you to have a look to, to that question and you, you will judge whether the answer will be part of the presentation or whether you want to, to, to give a separate answer. Yeah, this is the same person already uh, filed a question uh, con concerning similar. Um, I will not go in depth now, but I leave, leave it open, Maro. Don't, don't close the question. Okay. Once okay. we have the answers, I, I see how much I have answered in the other one because I don't okay. want to repeat twice. Okay. Okay. That's so. Okay, coming back on the last reference from the 61511 is the um, 62443 standards, which I call here clusters and parts. That is how the standard itself on the IEC website is calling it a cluster. So you have cluster one, that's your general section, and I have some slides coming up. You have cluster two, the policies and the procedures. Cluster three is mainly for systems, and cluster two is mainly for the components. The background of it is coming from the ISA 99. So that's the older standards or the IEC standard, uh, sorry, the ISA standard that was out in the early days. And from that, they started with the framework of the ISA 99. And it is the ISA 62443 committee who is running this. That means it is ISA 62443 leading into an IEC 62443 standard which can be purchased out of the IEC.ch for Switzerland website. Now, the international uh, standard itself are being developed jointly, as already mentioned, between the ISA and the IEC. And the general organization of the standard has four clusters. The first one here are the general concepts. The general concepts, by memory, we are still waiting, anxious waiting for the... Uh, section four here or part number four, which should give you the life cycle. So although I'll show you here the life cycle coming or hopefully coming when it will be released out of the 62443, but that is here the part which has not been released yet. That is why also in the beginning, that standard IC 62443, the OT security standard is not, let's say mature, released completely. What do I call mat mature? Well, typically a standard has a minimum lifetime between five to 10 years before they will do some revision again. And it takes always the first minimum five years that the standard becomes mature because they find some mistakes, some new recommendation, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sure that the maintenance teams are still working on all the comments received so far, and we will still have new revisions of different parts coming up, although they have been released some of them are already, again, under review. Now, the general sections are the concepts and the models. They will have all the abbreviations like any standard has. 
they will have the uh, security conformance metrics, which are also not being released yet. They are still in development. And as I said, the life cycle will be in part number four. Then cluster number two is more the general framework of the standards. Here they will talk about the different protection levels, the security levels, which I also have, uh, I have a summary here coming up later on in the webinar. We have four levels now. Then you have the security program requirement for the asset owners. That means for the operating company or the end users. You have the pet management. You have the requirements for the service providers. And that is here the new one that, which was added by memory a couple of years ago, which is part number five, which is still not uh, being released. That's also still in development. So we have three parts today. Sorry for my voice. We have three parts still in development. Those who have been very recently renewed is here the middle one, which is here cluster three part two, which is security risk assessment and system design. And for the person who just asked me the question concerning the mandatory requirement, well, I will recommend to look here in part, uh, in cluster three part two, because that is where the security risk assessment is clearly being explained. That's the technologies for on system level. What is system level? Well, just simply speaking, thinking about you are combining different instrumentation with your SIS system or your control or your safety PLC system. Well, that is where that system cluster tree will be of importance for you. And last but not least, the requirements on security of development for hardware, software development on components level. That means for the manufacturers, well, that is here cluster four, which has part one and part two. Not going too much in detail because I don't want to sound here as giving you a training course on the 62443, as I'm not an expert. I'm just giving you the summary of what I know so far using some parts of the standard. Now, stepping back from the details from the IEC 62443 and comparing it with the IEC 61511, the IEC 61511 has four SIL, four SIL levels, as most of you will be aware, because the SIL was introduced in 1997 by the 61508 edition one. And we all know SIL 1, SIL 2, SIL 3, and the higher the SIL, the more risk reduction, et cetera, et cetera. The more reliability, the more availability your system has to be available to reduce your risk. But something similar in measurements we do have as a security level. We have a security level one, two, three, and four. And the initial release of the 62443 was also talking about security level zero. And security level zero was simply saying you need nothing as a counter measurement for a security protection. In other words, would be similar to say we have a normal instrument with no security, sorry, with no safety in integrity level, with no SIL level. Well, that would have been called SIL zero, which does not exist in the standard because the SIL zero never existed. In the old edition one of the 61508, we had a class A and a class B below the SIL one that dis disappeared by the edition two of the 61508. Therefore, having said that, there is not a SL security level zero in the latest edition of the 62443. They have taken this out. So what is SL1, 2, 3, and 4? Similar approach, the higher the security level, the more protection you will have to build into your installation. For instance, an SL1 is a protection against a casual or a coincidental violation. And out of, let's say, experience so far in the industry, the majority of the safety PLC vendors are granting a security level, according to the 62443, between an SL1 and an SL2. And same as we have the approach on the um, SIL or SIL level, because I, I still keep on mixing those levels, but same approach as we do have in safety. When you talk about a SIL level, you may have a target risk reduction, you may have an achieved risk reduction based on the performance of your safety loop. And you may also use, let's say, instrumentation who are capable to achieve the SIL level. Well, something very similar we do have in security. We do have a target security level that your installation 
target will be defined after you have done a high level uh, security risk assessment, which I will show you in the life cycle later on. You may have to show what have been achieved in security level with your countermeasurements that you have put in place. And the countermeasurements needs to be capable to achieve that particular security level. So very similar to safety approach. Again, we have a, sim a similarity here in the security level between target achieved and capability. I took, of course, one of the most cleanest installations, which you probably will never find in the industry anymore, unless you have a complete isolated safety layer, which is here your SIS layer, from any control, any control center, any plant management, or any enterprise network, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, that would be very nice if you would only have a hardwired connection in between. So for those of you thinking of using I'm now talking about more of my safety hat again. Those of, you, those of you thinking about using a hardwired safety protection, like a solid state controller with no software related, no communication, well, that's probably a very secure installation. But as you all know, we have used modern installations with software programmable safety PLCs connected to all kinds of installation, extended remote IOs, or extend the chassis or maybe into your DCS or those of you who are using a combined system, well, that's where it becomes a challenge. Now, a few keywords and buzzwords that I want to throw at you here is, those who are circled here, we call this a zone. So you can have an enterprise, you can have a control center or a control room as a zone. You can have a specific system as a zone. And in between you have a channel. I'll not go through all these levels here of, uh, let's say, um, assets. I will not go concerning all those different topics because you will have a copy of that. What I want to say is the last bullet here, a zone can have a security level. Like you can have security level two on this one. You may have security level one on this one. You may have security level one on your control center. But how do you achieve your security levels on the control center itself? It's mainly based on the zone security level achievement. The channel can never achieve a security. The countermeasurements can, but not the channel. Very similar approach again to what we say in safety. The communication media where you communicate your safety message can never make it safe or unsafe. It is the protocol used in safety with similar approach what we do again here in security. Right, we have the first poll question for those who are still awake and Mauro can launch maybe. Yes, I launched the, the, the poll question. So far, very interesting, Tino, really. Thank you. You have the capacity to make uh, uh, simple whatever it is really quite complicated. It's the first time I say that I'm, I'm listening to this uh, presentation and uh, yeah, I found it very, very interesting. Thanks for that. So let's see. I don't know. So they are. They're still voting. Yes. So it doesn't yes. cost money. So let me read the question for you. Which cluster, that means which section of the standard is covering the system wide requirements? Do you think it was cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, or cluster four? It's a bit of a game. We are, we are playing just to get some interaction get your fingers to click on this button to say, which one do you think? And for those of you who are clicking the correct question means you have been listening. For those who have uh, mistakenly clicked here another one, that means that you have not been listening very well yet, but it doesn't matter. It's not an exam question. It's just the game we are playing. Okay, Maru, I think we can stop. We have about 70% yes, yes, yes. votes coming in, which is good. Yes, yes, yes. very good. So, uh... Stop it there and oh. uh, I share the result. Which is over here. All right. Okay. So, it as is. everyone can see, the red color, the red is here the correct question, or the sorry, the correct answer. And we have half of the group listening in today have actually picked the correct one. Because the ones who picked number one, that's the general section. Number two were the policies and the procedures. That's nothing to do with the system wide. The system-wide specific for the system-wide requirements are all down to section number three. And I picked that poll question for a reason that 
I do assume that the majority of you listening here today are either system engineers or end users or a combination of instrumentation engineers, design engineers, whatever. Well, your domain of playground will be mainly section number three. If there are some manufacturers, your domain of playground will be section or cluster number four. Anyhow, let me continue because see the clock is ticking and I was afraid I would be running out of uh, time as usual. Sometimes I'm talking too much. All right, so let me throw at you here the life cycle for the 615, sorry, for the 62443. You see, I'm, I am still too much in my 61511 uh, mindset. It's nothing wrong with that because those who have followed the 6511 life cycle, you replace the word safety with security. You close your eyes, you blink your eyes, you look at it. Well, that's the 6511 life cycle reformed in a security life cycle. Same approach. We're going to start with the, let's say, assessment phase. We call it in the 6511 the analysis phase. So, number one, phase number one, you're going to start with a high level cyber risk assessment which again is coming out of this new release section, which is 3.2, which is the one which I uh, mentioned to the person uh, filling in this question in the Q&A box. That's the section that I was referring to. Then it will then tell you to allocate your zones and your channels or conduits into your installation. So you take a digital footprint of your installation, you divide into zones, you say what channels and communication have between the zones, that's how you start. And then number three, you do a detailed cyber risk assessment. I would say here you most likely will need to have some expertise helping you to make that assessment on your installation. And once they come to a decision that you're, let's say during your detailed cyber risk assessment where they do some penetration in your system, some testing, and they come to the conclusion that your security level cannot be achieved, that's where they will have to recommend some counter measurements and here we go into the cybersecurity requirement specification, which we used to call the safety requirement specification. Now we call it cybersecurity requirement specification. So there we're going to specify what countermeasurements are needed to achieve what security level with an additional risk reduction for security purposes. Then you're going to go in phase number five, you're going to do design and engineering and cybersecurity uh, countermeasurements. That's what we do in our SIS design. That's here what we do in our design of cybersecurity counter measurements. You can also have other means of risk reduction. You can, for instance, say, we're going to lock the server room with double locks and no one can enter it, as an example. That's another means of risk reduction that could be one of the items. You're going to combine those um, counter measurements and the other means of risk reduction together in an installation commissioning and into a validation. The same validation that you have done in the SIS lifecycle with your site acceptance test. Well, even that here, we have to test your installation. And then for the end user here, that is the maintenance phase to maintain the security counter measurement performance. So you will have to monitor. You have to do your patches, you have to do your management, you have to keep your passwords, et cetera, et cetera. That's all coming into phase number seven. And if you do have a, let's say, uh, breakdown, or you have a security attack or whatever, you will have to have a recovery and a response plan uh, available and ready, which is here phase number eight. All of that must be managed, must have awareness, must have competence, the competency, all very similar to what we say in the 6.15.11 again. And of course, we have to come and make some assessments and audits, again, the same as we do in the 6.15.11. That's here a, let's say, a complete overview of the safety life cycle of the 62443 in line to the 61511 life cycle. Very short. I took this here and I give them uh, some credits for it because uh, I thank them for sharing that on the websites or on the internet. It's here coming from a company called AE Solutions. Some of you may know John Cusimano. He is very strongly involved in the 62443 committee is also behind the 62443, the 3.2 new release, which was out since June uh, 2020. There's no surprise that he refers in the white paper to this, uh, um, let's say, standard part of the 62443. And he gives you here like five steps to start. The white paper is downloadable free of charge after registration here on this uh, white paper link. 
They link it together with the bow tie analysis. For those who don't know what a bow tie is, that's a concept of an inventory and a fault tree analysis into one model, which grants more and more, uh, let's say, pop popularity into the industry. The five steps to cyber process hazard analysis are first to document your system. I will not go too much in detail. I will not steal here all the items coming from John and from Tim Gell. I, I forgot to mention the second author, which is Tim Gell here in this document. Then they will come to the uh, weakness of the vulnerability assessments. They are going to look at your networks, going to look at your policies, procedures, et cetera, et cetera. Then they're going to go into partition the systems into zones and conduits. That's what they do over here. This, these are pictures behind. Of course, you have to have a kind of a risk criteria, which is known with the risk matrix, a very similar approach as, as we have done on the SIS. 6, 15, 11 life cycle. So you have to talk about the consequences. You have to talk about the worst case scenarios. You have to talk about the threat scenarios, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to come up with a mitigation plan. The mitigation plan can be some counter measurements, can be some uh, specific items that you have to uh, additionally install into your installation, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The... Uh, White, sorry, the white, the webinar topic for today was also, let's say, promising you to give you some guidance on where to start. And again, I took some free guidance out of the industry, which are actually, it's my personal opinion, it's one of my uh, preferences that I prefer to introduce when I'm teaching the SIS lifecycle training courses, as Mara was mentioning. And I say, if you are new to security, as I was also new years ago, well, that's the document that I would recommend to have a look at. That is number one document, okay? The other document which already mentioned, which is not here in my list anymore, was the technical report nine from the ISA 84. I, I would say that is your starting point. Report nine of the ISA 84 starting point, number two. Download free of charge here, this recommended practice coming from DNV. And again, you have the link here below. That's the link for the document is called the G108 document. I like the document because it's coming from a joint industry project. So it's not coming from DNV. It's coming from participation of ABB, DNV, Emerson, Honeywell, Kongsberg Maritime, London, Norway, Petroleum Safety Authority, Norway, Shell, Norway, Siemens, Statoil, and Woodside Energy. So you hear some, let's say, some uh, big names into this document of companies who put their brain together, who say, how can we now start mainly for the offshore business on the oil and gas? How can we start to comply or how can we start with the guidance additionally on the 62443, which at the moment of release of this document, 2017, the 62443, had not so many, let's say, parts being released yet. So that is the one thing. And they also say the recommended practice intends to follow the regulatory requirements defined by the Petroleum Safety Authority, the PSA from Norway, and also from the HSE from England. This is a second document, which is coming up in a minute. From the same DNV, this is also coming from my, uh, let's say, colleague worker, uh, Stephen Smith, he mentioned those top 10 cybersecurity weaknesses or uh, items that you should start to think about. And number one, that DNV came up with the top 10. And I like to go through that just to give you some ideas on what that documents are looking at. Lack of cybersecurity awareness and training among the employees. Well, I can tell you now, Functional safety on the market since 1997, we still come across people who are not aware of things they should have known for the last, let's say, 20, 30 years. So even cybersecurity, as there's a fairly new topic, there is a lot of work to be done with training. And I'm happy to introduce at the end of this webinar some new trainings that I'm also launching, and I haven't told Mauro yet, otherwise he would start selling them, but as of today, he can start selling them also. But I'll show you that later on here on the slide. Second, remote work during operations and maintenance. 
all this concept from all this, let's say, service contract with maintenance providers, logging remotely into your system sounds wonderful, especially now with all this uh, COVID and, and Corona rules, we have to do all virtual access to system, even for some assessments. Well, that's not actually such a good thing for security, as you may be uh, understanding very simply. Understanding your standard IT products with the known ver the vulnerabilities in the product environment, a limited cybersecurity culture among the vendors itself, the suppliers and the contractors. I give you a very simple example for the oil and gas industry. How many end users have a clue today? What firmware inside their smart or hard transmitters are running their safety loops today? I think if you would ask the questions in the industry, you would be surprised how many people have no idea other than they know the model and the color of their transmitter, but they have no idea what firmware revision is controlling it today. Insufficient separation of data networks. It's quite remarkable 2012 that the attack in Saudi Aramco could kill 35,000 computers at one command. For a very simple reason, there was only one network to the complete country, connecting all the computers very happily in one family together. That's not a very clever thing to do. The use of mobile devices and storage units, including the smartphones, data networks between on and offshore facilities, insufficient physical security of data rooms, cabinets, etc. Software itself that is vulnerable, and then the outdated and the aging control system in facilities. I think you have more than enough to start to think about of your own installation if you have some operating or end users here in this webinar. Number three document, which I highly recommend, again, free of charge to download, is the uh, operational guide. It's called the OG86. And those who are logging in today from the United Kingdom, I'm pretty sure that you know this document very well. Second edition, because it was also a first edition, but it's a second edition out. And again, the link on the document will be on the bottom of the slide, which is the uh, um, operational guide, which gives you a, uh, let's say, a as low as reasonable practical demonstration of the facility towards cybersecurity. It is coming out of the IEC 61511 uh, in the British standard. It is recognized as a good practice. And the reference is related to the second edition of the 61511, which is the 8.2.4, which we actually abbreviate now as the SRAs or Security Risk Assessment. And in a, in a, in a summary of the document, both the OG 86 and the IEC 6511 referred to the 62443, which was the OT security standard, which I already explained to you, as the applicable international standard, as well as the ISA 8409 security countermeasurements related to your SIS or to your industrial automation, um, automation control. I was reading the question there, sorry. Uh, automation control system, security risk assessment, and implementation. Right, document number four, which is not free of charge, I have to say, unless you belong to the Namur, let's say, work group, or sorry, to the Namur end users group. It's an end user, it's a chemical group. For those who do not know what Namur means, well, again, there is a link here below, namur.net. Uh, this reference is coming from the work group 4.18. And uh, workgroup 4.18 is the automation security. And one document which I have a, uh, well, I got a copy of that document is the NA163. That's a security risk assessment of an SIS. It's again a different approach to what the OG from HAZ or to what the recommended practice from DNV had. But if you bundle them all together, I'm sure you will find your way, which one you prefer best enabled to start into your installation. Again, there are four documents that I would like to refer to. It's the NA135 um, and the N NA135, the NA is uh, one of the uh, worksheets, whereas the recommendations are called the NE. So the NAs are worksheets, the NEs are the recommendation. There's the 153 
that's the Auto Mesh Security 2020. That was released 2015. Then we have the NA163 was released 2017, and you have the NA169, which is the automated security management in the process industry. Right. And for those of you who are very keen on references, well, I got this again from Stephen uh, Smith in one of the other pr presentations or webinars we have been uh, doing. Um, well, we already mentioned a few of them. The ISO 27000 series with the 49 parts. We have the re report, uh, which is here, technical report 99, that security technologies for industrial automation and control system. We have the ISA 99, which is now also the IEC 62443. We have another standard here with the 7000 series that Steve was referring to. That's for security, for process control, that's specific for the energy, for the, sorry, for the energy industry, I was already in the industry world in my pronunciation, excuse me. Of course, you have the national compliance standard, you have the NIST, you have the NASA, which is for the people logging in from the Middle East, that's for the UAE, which is a normative requirement. In Norway, you have a normative requirement for nuclear, for instance, and of course, there are many association studies and recommendations webinar. I'm pretty sure that uh, our good old Google will give you lots of references which are on, on here but I thought I'd give it the majority. Right, I think this is my last poll question, Mauro. Yes, this is the last poll question. We have to speed up, a little, speed up a little bit because we are running out of time. I didn't stop you because the subject is really amazing and interesting. So let's speed Right, so up the, stand, the question is asked, the stand, the, sorry, the question is, which security level is associated with the following description? Protection against intentional violation using simple means with low resources, genetic skills, and low motivations. Is it security level one, security level two, security level three, or security level four? Again, it's a bit of a game that we are playing to see uh, or to get some interaction going. For sure that some of you may have fallen asleep already, maybe, who knows? <laughs> and now you may think like, oops, now I have to click. So hopefully you click the right button. Okay, I think I can I can stop because I see quite a lot of uh, interaction. All right. So let's uh, stop. End the poll. Let's stop the poll and let's share the result. And let me know if they are right. Okay. Well, the majority have it correct, so they were noticing the definitions of security levels, or maybe already practicing security levels or know what security levels means. So the correct definition was here indeed SL2. SL3 means more countermeasurements. And to my know-how today, security level three has um, as reference that I've been giving by expertise or by experts in the industry, have not been achievable in a process uh, industry installation like oil and gas, chemical, petrochemical. The maximum they go for is security level two. Majority is security level one, but there are some on security level two already also. Security level three and security level four are very hard to achieve, especially in modern, let's say, industries like we are, or modern installations in our industries in the process. Right, Maro, I will stop this. Oops, I forgot to click. But anyway, let me continue and finish the, say, I wanted to, share the results we have done this and i wanted to say stop sharing and that's good all right close it now it's gone sorry for that so managing cyber security that is my summary again coming from my dear friend uh, steve smith and he's again referring to bruce snyder and the first time he told me that i was actually starting to allow it all like you know <laughs> he said if you think technology can solve your security problems in terms of countermeasurements. That means you do not understand the problems and you do not understand your technology. Of course, this is more like a shocking statement for all of those thinking that you have a secure system. Maybe it means you don't understand your security countermeasurement performance as good as those who understand it different 
I may still come in to do some stupid things in your installation. So that's what I would like to close with. That is something to think about again. So 100% security will never be achievable unless, and that is the big question, unless what? That's something which I cannot answer for you. So let me go and finish the webinar. GMI, together with myself and a team of expertise in the background, can help you with the following services. On the 6, 15, 11, which we're not talking about too much today, so let's skip this. Let's focus on the 6, 2, 4, 4, 3. We do have some expertise to help you in industrial security management and assessments on installations. And we also even help some security management with some specific suppliers. Let's be more focusing on the training. And I changed this slide towards the last sessions of 2020 because now everything is virtual and it looks like 2021 while well, we keep on maintaining uh, the same strategy on training. So virtual and or classroom instructor-led training. Of course, the flagship training that I'm still um, supporting is my good old functional safety, functional safety engineer competency review program together with CLV Rheinland, which is a three and a half days, 100% online, including the exam, which is new, which I also will give you a very short definition on the exam online in a minute. We do have, since 2021, we do have cybersecurity fundamental course, which is another three and a half days. Again, same principle, same virtual and or classroom instructor-led training with also online exam. We do have a fast track recap course, a one day for security fundamental, which those of you think that they know already the fundamentals don't have to come to follow the three days because the cyber security fundamental exam is mandatory before you can do the last one, which is your security risk assessment course. Another three and a half days course, another one virtual and or classroom and with online or exam on paper. So all the exam with us can be written online and or on paper and on paper has a benefit. The time limit is different on paper gives people more time to think about, where on online, they are more under stress to perform in 90 minutes to perform 70, 70 multiple choice questions. Additionally, with the online exam, you will do a 20 to maximum 30 minutes, one-to-one -one interview with your instructor. Right, we also support you with the SIL manual from GMI which is a, a manual which we haven't talked too much today. Nothing in there yet for security. That's some of the ideas that we do have to maybe add a specific chapter in there for security, but that has not been decided yet. And with that, I will close this here and I will stop sharing and give the word back to Maro as he most likely will share. Yes. Uh, uh... Or yeah. do you want me to share the question and answers also? No, 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 no. I will, uh, I will do that. Uh, I will do that. Let me just add uh, on top of what you said uh, uh, that uh, we, we are also setting up uh, a training uh, um, for IC, IC, ICX uh, topics. Uh, very soon uh, we will detail that uh, in our website and in our presentation. Uh, we will come back on that. You just, uh, let me say, follow up uh, our web and you will get uh, information about that. It will be third leg uh, uh, for our training because after functional safety, now security, then it is uh, also ICX uh, uh, topics uh, with, uh, with uh, including certification. Uh, so let's follow up. We will uh, provide you further detail uh, later on. Uh, now we have uh, the question and answer. We are we we are really out of time, but uh, so Tino, we should try to to make it short. Uh, and uh, considering also that uh, everybody will receive copy of uh, uh, of the presentation as well. Uh, so let's go with the four questions. The first one is this one. Would you like to read? Uh, shall I read it for you? Tino? Okay, I will read it and then you can. Uh, the person was asking, I would like to know how to start on the no safety, no security 
philosophy. Okay. Well, I think that's, that is already answered. Eh? We answered you that follow the technical report nine. That's the first recommendation. Second was the DNV recommended practice. The third one was the OG86. And the fourth one was potentially the Namur. All together with the 62443, that is how you could start. Of course, it could be a, a massive to start to read all those documents. For instance, the technical report nine is about 150 pages, so it's not easy to start with. But at, at least it gives you some reference point on how you could start or you could start to follow some uh, other webinars that are also on the internet, or you could register to maybe follow one of the training courses. Okay, Maro. Which standard needs to be followed to meet security requirements in the 6511? I think that's the question that I recognized. Okay, Maro, next. The answer is, and I think it's the same person who was filling it into the Q&A. Um, and the Q&A was, let me first read the question for those who, who don't see maybe the question and answer. The person was asking, when performing a SIS cybersecurity risk assessment as mandated in the British standard EN 6 uh, 2017, which is the edition two with the amendment of 2017, clause 8.24, which I was referring to, you shall carry out security risk assessment. The question is, how do you set boundary conditions to the cyber uh, security risk assessment when the SIS may be a single PLC connected to a very large network? Would connecting the PLC via a lockdown firewall enable you to limit the scope of the cybersecurity risk assessment? I think that's it's a very good question. I cannot answer it 100% other saying that in my first um, impression looking at your question, I would say depending on the firewall counter measurement security level and how can you prove that it is locked down, that it will isolate your safety PLC from other potential threats. And the question that is always debatable, how secure is the firewall. And I will leave it with that. That's something to think about. So what I want to say for the rest, no matter, can you please come back? What I want to say to the rest, there is no requirement in the standard saying you shall follow the 62443. Uh, six, that means it's a note, a note in the standard, in a normative section. A note is typically treated as a informative recommendation from the normative section of the standard, what references you could look in and they give guidance to those three documents. So what I'm trying to say is here, it's not normative required to follow the 62443. It is normative required to do a cybersecurity risk assessment and how to do it, that of course is something that you will have to figure out. Okay, Maru. How soon is related with the cybersecurity? Continue. There is no simple relation between the SL and the SIL. Yes, we both have four SIL levels. We both have four security levels. You could, you could say maybe as a coincidence, but they have no direct relation to each other. It's not because you can have a SIL one installation that therefore you also have a SL one installation. Having said that, out of my summary, which I already made, it would be very silly to build a safety instrumented system with an SL nothing. Because SL nothing means there is no security protection. So as a minimum, my humble opinion would be every safety system will have a SL1 security level one security protection necessary. Okay, Maru. This is the last question, Tino. Then we have a new question in the question and answer. We can we can read it later. Okay. All right. Will this the webinar cover the BSEN? All right. Go on. Answer is yes, as you have seen. And for those who do not know what BS stands for, BS is the British standard. EN stands for the European norm. So typically, the double prefix in front of the standard in UK they call it the BSEN IEC with a number. That's typically what 
uh, they do. All right, Maru? Yeah, we will last, see what happens. We will see now what happens with BS and EN with the with the Brexit, eh? because we are already facing some some issue with uh, with all certificates and standards. That's and a good stuff. point. So this is an open uh, this is an open topic which will be clarified in the coming uh, months. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. In the meantime, we have a very last uh, poll question to be. To Can be I read asked. the question that is coming yes. in? The last one. Very quickly, my question is about which standard to use, but how to scope the activity. I'm having issues with suppliers that won't help me to quote the activity. Well, that's a bit of a sensitive question, so I'll, I'm going to be very polite in answering that. I would say, could it not be that the supplier maybe is not able to help you to quote the activity because he doesn't understand the activity that needs to be quoted, or he doesn't have the expertise in the house to quote it? That's maybe a potential solution. So make sure if you are the end user requesting for this quotation that you understand the scope of work that needs to be quoted. So the expertise must be first in-house and then try to find competent suppliers to help you. All right, Maru, finito. Yeah, as, as said, we, we are almost at the end of everything. Uh, and we have a very last question to the people which stay with us till now. And uh, yeah, we like to, to hear your feedback. You will, as said, uh, receive the presentation as a PDF. Uh, you will see our contact. Uh, we are always open uh, to listen your uh, further question or comments uh, or idea or suggestion you would give us. Uh, and again, uh, as said before, just follow us. Uh, uh, through LinkedIn or through, through our website, uh, you will get uh, some uh, additional information on how to reach us uh, uh, with the, with the, with the webinar. Uh, we are going to cover several topics, so let's let's meet us. Since we have no chance to meet us uh, personally, let's meet us uh, over this kind of uh, uh, procedure webinar. Uh, and so on. So uh, I have nothing else to add. Thank you very much uh, for to everybody, and see you next time again. Okay, Maru. Thank you. Dino, Thank you. you. Are Let's you, see. Are you Thank you very much also for the feedback. Very very uh, motivating for us. Okay, and the poll share the results. Okay. Yes. So thank you for your uh, votes. And thank you for staying with us for one hour and 15 minutes. So, I mean, come on, it's only 50 minutes extra, Mauro. <laughs> I'm not paid by the minute, as you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much again. So bye stay bye all safe all. and secure and see you in one of the next webinars. Bye. Bye. Bye.